Oh, yeah, and it started. So welcome uh, to our event. And uh, this event is a brainstorming event. So everyone is super welcome to participate and to talk. Uh, to, if you want to talk, just raise your hand. You see in your uh, Zoom uh, settings, there is this reactions and there is raise hand. But we just figured out that uh, sometimes it's not that easy to find this uh, uh, em emoji or whatever icon. And sometimes we also cannot see because if you don't look at the videos, we cannot see that you have raised your hand. So feel free to just unmute yourself and shout like, hey guys, let me talk and we will uh, definitely let you talk. Okay, so um, whom this event is for? For everyone, but especially for those who are somehow related to learning and development. If you are new to learning and development or if you are an expert in learning and development or you are interested in learning and development and especially if you are interested in learning analytics because this is our topic for today. If you build online courses and you want to um, know things on uh, learning uh, analytics. So, uh, wait. I'm going backwards. Um, what do we want to get out of this? So we know that uh, if we find out some challenges, we will not be able to find out the solutions to those challenges in this one hour. But we definitely wanted to get inspired, to get new ideas on board, to brainstorm, to have a little bit of lunch networking, lunch hour networking, and of course, to have fun. So let's have fun. And um, uh, to start having fun, Let's, uh, I will start this poll if I find it. Uh, yeah, as you can see, I also struggle with the, uh aha. -huh. Yeah, uh, I think it started. So uh, let me know how do you feel today? Uh, like uh, I'm also feel like a rock star and I'm also super excited. And if I would be able to choose all three, I would definitely do it. Um, and uh, before, I introduce myself and before I introduce Lavinia, Lavinia introduce yourself, please I invite you to introduce yourself, please write in the chat, who are you, where are you from, uh, what is your area of interest, if you maybe want to connect uh, further with people, you can also leave uh, your LinkedIn profile, so you're free to write uh, pretty much anything in our chat to um, uh, introduce yourself and to get to know uh, the community. Okay, and um, I will probably stop the poll. Yeah, we have uh, good answers here uh, and it's awesome. And let's continue. So uh, my name is Olga. I am a software engineer by profession and passion. And I've been also quite engaged with e-learning for the past seven years. And I also co-founded a technical startup where we create a learning management system for companies. And uh, yeah, uh, enough about me. Uh, a little bit about Workademy. Workademy uh, is an educational technology startup where we create learning management system for growing companies. And please follow us, subscribe to our LinkedIn page to get some updates on some ed tech news, some maybe learning and development interesting facts, and of course, updates on these events because these are events that we run monthly and they're super interesting. And this is why it's worth to be subscribed to our page. And yeah, today we are going to talk about analytics in corporate learning. What do we measure? Why and how? And finally, I'm super happy to introduce my and our guest today, Lavinia. Who is she? She's an awesome learning and development professional who co-founded uh, Offbeat. You probably all heard about Offbeat or read something uh, of it. And if you haven't, please subscribe now because uh, this is the way for you to get uh, every Sunday super curated um, content on learning and development. Great uh, things, great work, Lavinia. Thank you so much. And I will finally shut up and pass the mic to you. Lavinia will introduce the topics of analytics and then we will invite everyone to participate. So Lavinia, the stage is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you so much for, for having me. 
I'm, I'm going to start with something gloomy, although uh, this is a happy space, because uh, my take on learning analytics uh, from my experience is that it's not easy. <laughs> so we're going to cover some initial ideas and I really invite you to interrupt me, ask questions, uh, share your experience. And yeah, in this way we can learn a bit more from each other. Um, so to, to make it even more complex, I want to start with why do we exist as, as L&D? Uh, because it's not just about learning and development. And that's what I've seen in my experience and in other people's experiences. And to look at our responsibilities overall in an organization, uh, the best framework I could find is the employee life cycle. And if, you've ha if you haven't heard of it, it's basically a way to look through all the stages that an employee interacts with the, the organization you, you work for. And if you look at it, you can realize that you have broader responsibilities than just the L&D. We are responsible for onboarding, performance, career development, and sometimes even, even culture. So my first lesson learned about learning analytics is that your dashboards or analytics stack should not be only about the learning programs you're building with the intent of knowledge acquisition, skill acquisition, or behavior change. It should also have KPIs around the other areas you're responsible for. And I honestly wanted to introduce this because from my experience is easier actually to look at the, the other areas than it is to look at behavior change, which is really, really hard or skill acquisition and knowledge acquisition. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, Olga to move to, to the next slide. <laughs> We're gonna do something uh, co-facilitated co here. Um, as going back to, to learning programs, there are a bunch of frameworks out, out there that you could test in your work to, to measure ROI. And th there are two things I want to mention here. The first one is what I really, really like about them is that they, uh, they were built with the intention of going beyond vanity metrics. And what vanity metrics mean are basically, um, th they don't tell you if your program was successful or not, if your program reached your goals or not. Because usually like you build your learning programs, again, with the intent of uh, shifting behaviors or, or improving performance. Vanity metrics tell you only about how people re are reacting to your program. You, we usually measure NPS, which is Net Promoter Score. The, the question, uh, if you would recommend this program to other people, which doesn't actually tell you if your program was successful, uh, reiterating on that. So that, that's why I really, really like them. At the same time, um, what I don't like about them is that they are really time consuming. Like it takes a lot of time for one program. Yeah, AKA Smile Sheets. Uh, very, very good point, uh, Karina. I, I, I can see chat, the chat, <laughs> awesome. Um, so they are really, really time consuming. Um, and you've probably experienced that if you measured, if you try to measure ROI. And I'm really curious to, to learn more about your experiences around this, applying these different frameworks. Um, but the, for, for the purpose of, of this uh, meeting precisely, I wanted to uh, talk to you a, a bit more about the Kirkpatrick model, which is probably the most famous model out there to pro probably make a point for why I like and why I don't like uh, th these frameworks. Okay, if you can go to, mm -hmm. to the, other, the, the other slide. Um, and first, obviously, it, it looks at more than vanity metrics, you know, and le let's see how it does that. The first one, reaction, which uh, measures how employees feel about the training, is uh, happy smile sheets, uh, just like Carolina mentioned. 
because it you we mostly assess this through uh, after training or after program surveys and we ask people how they feel about the program they they just went through the second one becomes a bit more complicated because it looks at the the what, what people actually learned from the program it uh, looks if uh, the learners have acquired the intended knowledge the intended skills and and so on um, and we measure this let's say in the Kirkpatrick model we evaluate this uh, either by uh, looking at pre-assessment and post-assessment to see the differences in, in the two in the two stages and if people actually learned something new in in the program um, and then things get way more complicated the the third level which is impact looks at behavior change and we look at behavior change through this really really complex tools like we look at behavior behavior change through observing interviews, uh, peer or manager assessment, which it starts taking a lot, a lot of our time. And if you're like me, we're in charge of so many things at the same time, and it's definitely not easy to look at each intervention and measure it, you know, that deep. And the final level, which is probably the most important one and the one that the business actually wants you to measure is results, because results looks at business impact. You know, if you're doing this sales program, your business will want to know if you've generated revenue through your program. And we, to, to look at results, we really have to be connected to the business and look at all types of dashboards that are out there and that are actually, you know, measuring the performance of, of the employees. And one more thing I wanted to say here, and I think it's really, really important, is that at the beginning of your, of, the, of designing your learning program, you should establish the, the KPIs you're going to measure, you know, because uh, otherwise, when you if you want to measure results, you won't know wh what you, you should look at, you know. So, yeah, um, what I learned just by looking at this model and believe my my uh, word that the other ones are uh, if if not if don't they don't have the same complexity they might be even more complex than than this one I definitely recommend you there's this um, a book learning analytics and I, I will look at uh, I'll look for it and uh, send the the link here which actually goes through all these different models and gives examples of how they've been used in in real world but so, so this is really, really hard. I've heard of something uh, that it's, it's really interesting to me and um, it's actually borrowed from marketing. You, you've probably heard of A-B testing. I've never heard before of A-B testing used in, uh, in learning analytics uh, until I spoke to some people that were doing that. So look, just to, to give you a brief overview of how this works, you always start with picking a KPI, you, the KPI you want to improve. And like for the purpose of the exercise, let's say it's sales or revenue. Okay, so we intend to boost revenue and sales through our learning program. The second step is looking at two audiences that are very, very similar. And you have to spend some time here to make sure that like they are really similar. Maybe it's the same manager, but but different different groups of teams. Uh, maybe it's uh, they, they are selling to the same people. They have the same mar market context. Uh, they have um, similar background. They are obviously don't they don't have to be identical, but they do have to be similar. Once you have these two groups, just deploy your program for group A and not for group B. Let group B just do their job without uh, you uh, touching them in any way. Deploy it for, for group A 
and start measuring KPI progression. And there are three things that could happen here. The uh, revenue or sales will go up, they will stay the same, or they will go down. I don't know why, but they can go down. It can go down. If it went up, you don't have to say, okay, I was successful. My, my program was the one that did this. Instead, you have to go uh, and talk to your audience uh, and actually ask them what, um, what helped them reach those goals and uh, accomplish their, their targets. And from, uh, from what I've heard, you can, we can actually make a list of every possible factor that we can think of and just see if people select our learning program. If learning our learning program has a, a big percentage or a kind of a percentage of, of impact in, in, uh, in their work, uh, that's when we should go ahead and deploy it to audience B, you know? And th this is kind of, it's not, okay, 100% accurate, but it gets rid of some biases, you know, uh, along the way, because you will compare um, audience A to audience B, you will see a change in audience B, and uh, you will ask them if your program might have impacted their, their work. If um, the, the targets, uh, the, the goals uh, stay, the results stay the same, or they maybe go lower, uh, it doesn't mean uh, your program, by default, your program is not good, but you, you should take the time before deploying it to audience B to uh, research why it didn't work. And you can actually go talk to participants, go talk to their manager and yeah, check why that didn't, didn't happen. So yeah, uh, I, I've talked a lot <laughs> right now. So I want to, to throw uh, the, the first question I have for everyone in here is if you've experienced before with any of the, the frameworks in the list I provided or any other frameworks uh, um, in, out of there, you know, and what was your experience with them? Um, and while, uh, uh, while you guys are thinking on what to answer this, I want to also throw some questions, Lavinia, while you were talking. I love this A-B testing. It's a concept that uh, I know quite uh, well because of my software engineering background. And while in software engineering or for some marketing purposes, it's pretty fast experience. So for example, we can launch two slightly similar, similar landing pages with different wording and connect it to Google Analytics. In a couple of days, we will get the results. Uh, while for the learning program, it might take like for six months, half a year, especially if we are talking about uh, uh, sales performance, because sometimes sales cycles, especially in B2B, can last for six months. So we will get these results quite further. And um, while it's okay for maybe big established enterprises to spend this time analyzing the programs, it might not be applicable to small startups that want to introduce learning and development, but don't have this time span. So this is another challenge that I want to bring in. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right. Um, I have a background, like um, I've been working with this huge company and they have so many employees or, you, you know, you, you can take some time to do this, not as much, but some time. But my guess is that uh, instead of, you know, working a lot on your program and putting it out there for everyone and, you know, failing, uh, prototyping something, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the whole program. Um, it can definitely work for e-learning, I guess, um, as well. Um, it, it might help with you learning something about your program and improve it for the second audience. And I have hard to check how it has changed after the leadership program. Yeah, actually, sorry, Olga, what I wanted to say was that um, we track our uh, leadership uh, program 
um, one of the looks we're, things we're looking at is um, the EMPS, maybe you've heard of it, is Employee Net Promoter Score. And what we did was make a list of all the things that uh, the manager could impact. So beyond engagement as, as, as a whole in the whole organization, the question was, okay, but how do I as a manager uh, impact the engage, engagement of my team? Yeah, exactly, Olga. Uh, and um, we look at feedback, we look at how they explain uh, the, the role, we look at uh, how they explain, um, they do processes, we look at a bunch of things. And uh, yeah, we do this two times a year. So we can compare, um, you know, to, to different editions and in between, we have an ongoing learning program for our leaders. And yeah, we can, we, we usually look at the MPS, maybe that's, so. mm -hmm. that's something. I will unmute Carolina. Uh, I, I mean, I will ask to unmute because I cannot. Yeah, Carolina, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to follow up a little bit also on what Ola wrote in the chat. I was um, going to say the same thing. I think that behavior change is so hard to measure because it's incredibly difficult to isolate the factors that impacted behavior change. It can be anything. If you do A-B testing for a longer period of time, then your chances of getting it right are obviously uh, greater, but it's, it's so difficult. And um, this is what we do because this is the one thing that works best. But I always have the second thought that it's not really scientific because it's just the opinion of the person. I feel that this has impacted me and it is always biased a little bit. So I was just wondering if any of you have any um, ideas or experiences how to get rid of the, the, the people factor, so to speak. I know it sounds terrible, but to take a look at very hard, let's say uh, numbers uh, or, or data that is less subjective, but maybe a bit more objective. Yeah, actually, this was also my question, because when Lavinia was uh, talking, a lot of times I heard something like, talk to people, ask uh, uh, pre-assessment, post-assessment, but I heard a lot of like talking to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we are talking dashboards and numbers, uh, can we somehow transport this talking to... Um, to the dashboards, how can we, for example, tools providers and software engineers, can we do anything to, <laughs> to make it happen? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, to uh, Just a thought I'm having and I've been having uh, to answer uh, Carolina. I was wondering, looking maybe looking at different sources of data could help with getting rid of, of the bias like looking at 360 feedback, at engagement surveys, talking and at the same time talking to people and see if there's a trend in there, maybe that that could help. I'm not sure, um, it's just a, a thought. So this is, I think, what, what we, this is what we're doing. And I think a lot of companies are also following the same path. Mm -hmm. But it's still, I think, asking people if the, the thing that comes to my mind um, in terms of numbers is you can use a scale, for example, right? And you can say that, but still, it's very subjective. The, my confidence in performing a certain activity has risen from this to that, let's say, right? This is a question people answer. And we assume or we have an answer somewhere along the way that it's due to our uh, learning initiative so we can have some numbers there but I would still say they're very much subjective and I've once heard an opinion that it's totally impossible to measure HR uh, things and, and learning things because it's there are so many factors involved and there are so many people factors involved and, and subjectivity that it's basically unmeasurable that whatever Roy we're doing uh, or KPI measurement then it's always um it's never numerical, really. you know, it's always somebody's opinion about something or somebody's feeling or gut feeling about something because you can really measure that. So um, looking at how many people tried to build frameworks and try testing different stuff and none of them like uh, got to this holy grail of learning analytics, um, I might reach the same conclusion. Uh, honestly, um, yeah, it doesn't mean, in my opinion, it doesn't mean we, we shouldn't try and do something, 
especially for for some uh, I, I was mentioning at first i really i honestly think that you can look at career development and onboarding um, stuff like uh, we have a huge career development program right now and our main kpi is internal transfers because our 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 goal is to help people um like progress through their careers in our company so in in other settings i think we have some KPIs we can follow, but yeah, when it comes to behavior change and knowledge acquisition, that that's probably the hardest. Yeah, I would ask Walter to to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, well, I do not have uh, so much experience with uh, analytics, but uh, for example, for um, also. Uh, Lavinia has mentioned the 3660 uh, evaluation that it's a, a really a really good factor from from change change on uh, how to evaluate change or how to evaluate the uh, learning also um, also for me is really important when when I measure uh, change or or learning it's just the factor of evaluating uh, through um, a long time factor. So I, I made an evaluation at this moment, three months after, or, or two months, four months, six months. That is a really good way just to, to, to know if the, there is a, a real increase or, or change in the behavior from, from, from the, mm -hmm. the, the activity or the intervention, intervention that you have made. Are uh, at the long play, long term. Um, also, I have here heard uh, that um, sometimes uh, when you made a survey just to ask about uh, the impact of a uh, training or a change uh, management process, intervention, etc., you can also ask about other factors that could affect the. Mm -hmm the the transformation and that's not probably a way to explain it because you want to really know the impact of of the the training or the action that you have made but also could help just to control all the things that that uh, can affect the the real result mm, just uh, just about this uh, is my my point of view thank you Thank you. <laughs> Carolina. Ah, it was a like. Yeah, so. it was like a like for <laughs> that. But yeah, so, so basically, if we yeah, absolutely, Walter, I agree with you. If we define all the other factors and we monitor them as well, then we are getting closer to what we want to reach. And I wanted to mention one more thing, uh, uh, also to uh, connect it to what Levinia said before everybody's always asking how to measure behavior change and no one knows that, right? But this is something that pops up and comes up every time learning analytics is uh, being spoken about. So it also shows us that this is a huge difficult topic. And uh, I think maybe just as you said, maybe there's just a, a certain line we can get to and the rest has to be uh, good assumptions basically about what it is. Yeah. So Ola is asking in the chat, would you also potentially go to subordinates of a manager who went through the leadership program and ask them if they see any change? Has anyone ever done that? Uh, I, I've never done that. So, so maybe, I don't think it's a bad idea, but yeah, has anyone experienced with that? Um, I think it's a very good idea, actually. Um, it's uh, um, like 360 for for leaders, it should be done as well. I, I'm i pretty sure that I, My only take on this, just thinking about it, it's that it depends a lot what you're trying to, to measure, like the, the, what skills are you trying to measure for your leadership team? Like if, if there are people management skills, mm -hmm. okay, you, you can definitely look at their subordinates, but not sure if, they can tell you direct reports. They can tell you about their business understanding and uh, business yes, business yeah, 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 business yeah, and so on. So maybe that's a factor to consider. Yeah, yeah, sure. Walter, 
yes, is um, yes, uh, as uh, Lavinia has has said, uh, um, a three six sixty three six sixty program just have to to get us uh, into a re the real effect of a leadership program. You have to ask, and that also depends of of uh, how you make the questions. What kind of question do you make? Mm, you have to re uh, also. Uh, there are there are differences between an autocratic uh, style of leadership than a democratic, etc. Mm, that depends on really what do you need to 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 measure yeah. or to create analytics uh, to have a, a real a real sense of what is going on with a leadership program, with a change program, or whatever you want to to really measure. Yeah, yeah. And again, we are talking here about uh, developing the specific uh, surveys and asking people. So no numbers on dashboard, <laughs> apparently uh, for leadership program as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting with the, we have different takes on this, like our leadership program focuses on three areas, um, managing people, managing the business and managing yourself, you know, so yeah. That, I was thinking about the, the three dimensions. Kumi, where are you raising your hand? Or was it just some exercise that you were doing? <laughs> no, um, I had too much sunlight coming through, so I was just turning the blinds down. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, I there was something that I wanted to ask, but I forgot with uh, all this leadership um, uh, training. Uh, things uh, um, I uh, maybe someone wants to share some real challenge related to learning analytics that you've experienced recently and that we uh, can discuss here that we can help with maybe <laughs> <laughs> behavior change definitely hard. behavior change yeah let's let's change our behaviors now <laughs> Walter, I, I think you're. Oh yes, uh, mm, I have uh, the experience of a uh, leadership or change process, uh, change management process is uh, working with uh, uh, employee satisfaction satisfaction uh, survey. It can help in some way. You can really specify. It the departments, the units, or etc. So at this uh, level, could help uh, a uh, satisfy employee satisfaction survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Actually, I got a, um, a challenge that I want to bring up. A uh, thing that I've heard a lot uh, is that uh, sometimes the um, numbers that uh, learning and development managers wanted to measure or to see are different from those that uh, top management wants. So <laughs> sometimes learning and development managers want to see how successful the program was in terms of uh, like dropout rates uh, from the each model to each model, like the conversion, uh, where, what questions were difficult. So they could actually improve the quality of the program while the management was asking, give me ROI, give me KPI, uh, give me the numbers. Uh, I wanna see a lot of numbers, but, and it was like this discrepancy and people were worried about that they wanted one thing and the management wanted the other. I wanted to know if it was the real challenge and how do you cope with it in your work? I think you can go for measuring both. Um, because business will always want to see a bit more um, numbers and KPIs. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we haven't done this internally, but I've heard of KPIs like um, how many people will read the article that we've just posted or how many people will actually finish a course or as you said, those dropout rates. It's something that's uh, also interesting for business to see if there is, um, uh, if, if there is return on investment. What we're doing, and it, it, it may, it's making sense. We have a, a, we're launching right now a juniorship program um, that we're going to measure in terms of ROI exactly because we'll see how much time is time costing money is being saved. Uh -huh. 
um, by, let's say, senior mentors um, that who do not have to mentor juniors, but the juniors can be mentored through our program in a different way, and how much time money is actually being saved. So this can be a, a direct translation into uh, the financial gains or how quick can those juniors enter commercial projects? So how quick do they start actually making money for the company, right? If our program, if, if they go through our program and they start quicker, then we're simply making money quicker. But these examples, first of all, they don't, I mean, on the one hand, they do show a little bit the uh, effectiveness of the, of, of, of the program because they're capable of doing this quicker. Um, but then again, there could be a number of factors that has influenced this. It doesn't have to be the program only. And there, I think that there are very few examples like this where you can actually financially measure the impact mm -hmm. uh, with leadership and people's skills and behavior. Just as we have said already, I think it's super difficult. It, it sounds to me that it, it's close to what I, I mentioned as a career development program, rather like moving up to, to other projects or other roles. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I just to piggyback on that, like um, I really think that for career development programs, there are some things you you can measure. You can measure the difference uh, it takes for if you wouldn't have had the program and you would have had to recruit people from outside or even from inside the the team. So so recruitment costs. Um, it, there are also like um, the cost of onboarding is all, always different between internal and external hires as well. Um, and even look, okay, if we wouldn't have had the program, would have this, these people moved to other roles and how much time would have taken to, to do so. Um, so yeah, definitely career development it is something you, you could show uh, because it's about, from my opinion, it's about pe pe people numbers like HR, um, ROI, like engagement. Uh, they are not as much about business and, and behavior change, you know? So that's how I see the, the main difference between these two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ola. Uh, I think you, you had your hand. Um, yeah, I just like to echo whatever uh, Carolina and Lavinia just mentioned. Um, in my organization, it's it's a consulting company, so people are the most important resource. So, um, and the complexity of projects is very very high, and it's very difficult to hire someone from the outside because it's extremely complex, uh, and it's extremely company project oriented. So onboarding costs a lot of time and a lot of money. So we are to um, hire 300 people in the next six months. Um, so it costs, the company gonna cost around 4 million just to the time until, so basically the time until they're fully working on the same levels, everybody else. So what I'm looking into is how do I ensure that onboarding uh, costs are like say 30% low, how do you automate that? And how do you um, not behavior change, but more cost saving as Carolina has also mentioned. So how do you make sure that there's more automated so it's not people, <clears throat> because at the moment the way it's, uh, it's experienced people spending, I don't know, one week just sharing the knowledge, just inserting, and it's a lot of money, just one day of this super high level professional. So. For us, is this so? Number one, it's onboarding, and that is also we we look into. We have summer and winter universities, which means that's a way to attract talent, young talent, and this is also under my umbrella in terms of learning and development. So we have our people being mentors and teachers. So it's one month of um, this engineering company, and this is also goes into recruitment. So looking into okay, how can we hire? So how can we attract and potentially hire from this? And then it goes into onboarding. And then it goes into um, <clears throat> uh, recruit a, a T TA team saying, okay, we can't hire anybody with the skills. Okay, and then it's my job to identify what kind of potential people, what, how many people do we need at the end of the year with this particular skill in order to achieve our business goals, say 50 people. And it will be my job to create the learning path identify people who could be very good, suitable for this. 
and even sometimes reward them. So if somebody says, yeah, I don't really want to learn this and this and that, it's like, okay. In the same way as you do for talent acquisition, you reward people for bringing the people on board into the company. You do the same way. It's like, if you go through this company, if you get this competency and at the end of the year, you get a certification, you go to this mentorship program, yada, 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 you're going to be rewarded because the company needs that. Um, so it's kind of like seeing the pain points of business and supporting that. Mm -hmm. So being like as a consultant for different departments from compliance to TA to HR to business development and whatever not. So this is kind of, so I was really happy to see this employee on um, life cycle. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. TA is talent acquisition, right? Uh-huh. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it's a huge, right? And uh, how do we actually measure the success on each of the steps of this li life cycle and uh, combine it with business goals and stuff? It's a big, big topic. I'm, I'm really glad that we are talking about it. Walter. Um, well, um... I do not have experience with uh, onboarding, but I have experience with knowledge transfer. It's uh, in some way similar, um, just when you have a person who is going to retire or change their position to another one, just to make a knowledge map of uh, all the things that are needed, needed for the success of the position. And after, after you create the, the knowledge map, you make an action plan to transfer to the to the new newcomer. Mm, we measure the satisfaction uh, each uh, each two months, and also we 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 ask the, the manager and other connections from that position about their feedback from from that. Mm, you can uh, we can say that uh, uh, people are more satisfied if they're fa if they're uh, uh, make the the knowledge transfer because they can start uh, easier on their new position and well in some way mm, you uh, do not expend expend uh, too much money from mm. you don't lose too too much money uh, just waiting that the person starts and, and learn everything that uh, you have to, to learn to really be competent on, on the position. Just, uh, just an idea of that. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, thing. As Ola said, uh, uh, people are your greatest resource, and it's not only in consulting companies; it's everywhere because people possess the knowledge that is needed to do their jobs, right? And uh, uh, if this knowledge is kept and maintained, this is the great resource for the company and newcomers to learn from. So I totally agree, and I am pretty. Uh, sure that if you measure the time spent to start of uh, a newcomer that has learned from the same position, people, per person who transferred his knowledge, their knowledge, and someone who came and haven't done that, that it will be much bigger. So yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, we still have uh, we still have some time. And uh, I, I would like to somehow wrap it up with some nice maybe follow up steps and maybe maybe uh, the nice thing that you could share right in the chat if you can, if there is anything that you will do first thing after this. Uh, uh, what is this uh, webinar brainstorm <laughs> uh, talk is there is anything that. Uh, you are going to do next thing that you finish this uh, call. I mean, work related, not like I'm going to have my lunch finally. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I'm going to just say it <laughs> while people write it in there. But I, I really find Ola's case study really interesting because I didn't know that uh, as learning you can um, help with talent acquisition and employer branding but what they're doing is way more tactical like the, the, there's definitely time involved and per involved there 
purposefully to actually, you know, attract, attract people. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I, I was also stuck in reading <laughs> what people were writing. Mm -hmm. So there is, for example, like just to give a bit, a bit of a um, business case, a case recorded, but so I'm not going to say too much. <laughs> so um, currently the company is moving away from uh, manual testing um, to automated testing. So we have, um, I don't know, about 100 people who are still in manual. So it's like, so the skills soon are going to be very obsolete because the company is going to a different direction. So it's my job to kind of identify where the company is going and how can we transfer them into a different position. So there's going to be okay for them to move either into developer role um, or um, and analytics and whatever not. So kind of see, not to kind of say, okay, you don't have a job anymore. So this kind of in this way, they're going to be internal mobility in nudging people take a um, kind of slight move away from the current career. Mm -hmm. Ola, we, we can talk about it. I have a big experience with manual QA people transferring to automation or to other jobs. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a great topic. Um, yeah, I have, probably for me, the first thing that I'm going to do, I will, I heard a lot that uh, before starting training program, you should set up KPIs makes total sense. And probably I will check our analytics model in our LMS and see how we can enable these KPI settings uh, and mapping them to, to the success of program. It's, it sounds pretty interesting uh, and uh, quite make, makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, uh, so we have 10 minutes left. Uh, and I want to give you some presents because we prepared, Lavinia and I had prepared some gifts for you. And uh, the first is mine. Uh, we decided to have this Christmas present and for the participants of the LD Happy Space event, offer six month uh, trial of our LMS. Uh, there is this um, link that you can just follow and uh, fill uh, your um, email that we can contact you and follow up on this. I think it's a great opportunity for you to uh, try it out and uh, um, yeah. Uh, and also we will be glad to hear any feedback. And Lavinia also has something to offer you. So Offbeat is not only the free resource on Sundays of great curated content, but it's also a resource of programs where you can learn and learn a lot about learning and development, how to create successful L&D programs. And I think right now they're not active, but they will be able in December. And you can apply to, um, uh, you can, uh, Lavinia, can you tell what, what people can do with this uh, uh, discount code? Yeah, sure, sure. So it's from Stan. You can basically use it in the checkout page to get a 10% discount for, for the programs we're going to launch in, in uh, December. They are going to be around, again, we already have the program of learning experience design, and we're going to do that again around uh, being an L&D consultant and around uh, developing onboarding programs. Cool, thank you. So with this great, uh, great uh, uh, gifts and with this uh, great uh, follow-up, we, we can wrap it up and call it uh, um, a lunch. <laughs> um, and uh, if you have any more questions, we still have time. So please feel free to ask. Maybe you wanna ask Lavinia about anything or me or anyone who's here, um, please go ahead. I see a lot of hearts. I will also do some heart <laughs> reactions. Oh. <laughs> okay, then, then I think that uh, we can wish each other the great day, the great lunch and uh, 
yeah and uh, let's do this and someone can take a screenshot maybe <laughs> okay uh it will be me i will take it <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work like that, but I have a screenshot. I will send you over the email. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Thank you. You too. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>